Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, condensed matter seminar. It's my great, a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, Professor Sergio Hizendi. Um, Professor Hizendi is, um, is uh, from the physics department at the Federal University of uh, Pernambuco in Hisifi. It's I think that's the uh, northeastern uh, metropolitan area of Brazil, uh, the fifth largest actually. And um, he got his uh, master and PhD degree from MIT in 1965 and 1967, both in electric engineering and material science. And he was a visiting professor at the University of uh, California at Santa Barbara and the University of Zurich. Um, he also um, held uh, several science managing positions, including scientific director of uh, Pernambuco Science Foundation, secretary for science and the technology of Pernambuco, president of uh, FINEP, the main federal agency for funding of science and technology in Brazil <laughs> from 2003 to 2005. And uh, last but not least, uh, Minister for Science and Technology of Brazil from 2005 uh, to 2010. Um, his scientific activities, however, have never been interrupted by uh, these uh, science managing positions. Uh, he has published over 220 scientific papers on dynamic uh, excitation phenomena in magnetic materials, magnetic nanostructures, and spintronics. He is a member of several scientific societies and has received several prize and awards in Brazil and abroad. So uh, without further ado, uh, Sergio, please take it, take it away. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like first to uh, thank Shulei Zhang for the invitation to give this uh, seminar. And uh, I understand from Shule that uh, most of the condensed matter faculty and students uh, don't work in magnetism. So uh, at least half of this presentation is made for people who don't work in the area. And then later I'm, I'm going to show some of our uh, more recent results, very superficial. But before doing this, uh, I know that Recife is not uh, well known, so I'm showing this map. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, and the capital Brasilia are the most known cities in Brazil. Recife is in, on the uh, northern, northeastern coast. And uh, here is the Amazon, very big area. Uh, you know of the rainforest and you know of our concern this year, what's going on with the, with the Amazon. Our current president uh, is a person that doesn't believe in, in climate changes, he doesn't believe in science, and in the beginning he supported farmers to move into the Amazon and produce. So what's going on in the Amazon is not uh, by chance. It's going on because we had very bad uh, example from above. Uh, Recife was the, the host of the International Conference on Magnetism in the year 2000. I was chairman of the conference. This conference is held every three years in a different country. And in 2000, we had uh, this big event here, a very nice uh, event. And uh, we have a federal university in Recife. Uh, in Brazil, there are about 60 federal universities all over the country. And this is the main entrance of the campus, some view of the campus with the convention center. And these are some views of our center, which is called exact sciences. We know that science is not exact, but this is an old name here. Uh, and 
In the physics department, we have a magnetism group with five faculty, and we have several labs shown here. We, we, we had some means of preparing samples, uh, an old sputtering system for making thin films, system for doing bigger light scattering, uh, my, use of microwave techniques for several measurements. Here is a homemade ferromagnetic resonance uh, setup. For the non experts, uh, magnetic materials are materials made of elements of, uh, for instance, the, the iron transition groups. These elements, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, they have, uh, they have atoms that have a, a net uh, spin, a net magnetic moment, because they have unfilled shells. Same happened with some rare earth uh, uh, elements. And so they have microscopic, atomic, uh, magnetic needles. This is the condition for material to be magnetic. Only one condition. Of course, to be a strong magnetic material, besides having a magnetic moment, they, have, they need to have an interaction between the magnetic moments. And each strong magnetic material can be characterized by a hysteresis cycle. And the type of hysteresis cycle determines the application. Soft magnetic materials have very, have very narrow hysteresis cycles. This is not one curve. These are several curves. They don't coincide, but they are very close. And they are used to make transformer, generators, motors, magnetic heads for, for magnetic recording. Uh, if the hysteresis cycle is broad and, and, and high like this, the material is a hard magnet, which, which are also used for making generators, motors, loudspeakers, microphones, and so on. And uh, if they have intermediate uh, history in cycle, they can be used to store information by, because once the medium is magnetized in a bit, the magnetization is maintained, but the magnetization can be erased and it can be magnetized in another direction. A magnetic recording is, is a technology that has been used for over 100 years. So magnetic recording is an evolving technology, began in the 19th century. Uh, first recorders were used a wire, a ferromagnetic, a steel wire that had ferromagnetic properties, and then the technology evolved, and in recent years, uh, quantum physics came, spintronics came, and, and, and as a result, the, the amount of information that can be stored uh, in a hard disk is very large, and one can also have a magnetic random access memory. I'm going to speak more about these two. And students often ask, why isn't the electron spin important for conventional electronics? The reason is that conventional electronics is made with materials that are longer than the mean free path. So when the electron uh, this, uh, moves in, in, in a material like this, it undergoes collisions. And in the collision, they lose information of their, their spin. However, if we make a, make a magnetic nanostructure, I'm showing a simple one here, a multi-layer in which we have a, a magnetic layer, a non-magnetic layer that can be a metal or an insulator, another magnetic layer. Uh, in this case, if the thickness of this layer is small enough, a few atomic uh, distances, then one can have a quantum coupling between two magnetic layers. And this quantum coupling produces very important effects. Magnetic uh, 
multi-layers began to be studied in more detail only 10 years ago. And, and the discoveries that were made uh, were very important for establishing new fields of work. If we have an electron moving in material that has a longer mean free path than its displacement, the electron motion can be controlled by, by this spin. We call this spin-dependent transport. And a good example of the spin-dependent transport uh, is what uh, gives rise to the giant magneto resistance. The, the first paper to report a giant magneto resistance in a magnetic multilayer was published by this team. I point out this first author here because he's a Brazilian a professor in the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in the southernmost state in Brazil. Uh, but uh, Mario Babich was actually working in the group of Albert Fecht, the French, uh, brilliant French physicist, that of course had the idea and suggested Mario what to do. And what they did was this. They took a multi-layer in which, with, with no field, there is a coupling between the magnetic layers so that one layer has the magnetization pointing to the right, the other one has the magnetization pointing to the left, and then the resistance of this motor layer to a current passing in this direction is large. I'll, I'll explain why it's large. But then if they applied, when they applied a large magnetic field so that all layers are magnetized in the same direction to the right, then the magnetization decreased by 50%. So this is this was called giant magneto resistance. The magneto resistance is observed in many magnetic wire, any ferromagnetic wire like iron, cobalt, and so on. But the magneto resistance of iron is a fraction of a, a percent. Here they observed 50% change in the resistance. The explanation for this uh, were provided by, by Fert and, and, and co-authors is this. Uh, if the electron travels through a layer, there is no collision. But when, when it goes from one layer to the other, there is an interfacial uh, collision always, and this represents a resistance. If the spin is in the same direction as the magnetization, the collision is uh, smaller than if the spin is opposite to the magnetization. So when the two layers are oriented in the opposite direction, we have a small resistance in series with a large resistance. And here, a large resistance in series with small resistance. And the overall resistance is large. However, if the two magnetization point out in the same direction, then we have two small resistance in series and in parallel with two large resistance, and the whole resistance is, is small. So this is the explanation, uh, simple-minded explanation. But the physics is this, and people have done models, calculation, and so on, and this explains the giant magnetic resistance. So the giant magnetic resistance can be used for making a spin valve. Let's say that we have two magnetic layers here, blue ones. One has the magnetization pinned, pinned uh, 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 to another uh, layer, to another material, an antiferromagnetic substrate, by what is called exchange bias. And let's say this is a free layer. The free, free layer can have the magnetization in the direction. And then there is a, let's say, a copper layer in between. And when we pass a current in this copper layer, if the magnetization of the upper layer is in the same direction as the lower one, then we have low resistance. So if we apply a current, we have low voltage. When the magnetization goes to the other direction, 
Then we have high resistance and high voltage. So this is uh, a sensor, a spin valve sensor. This spin valve sensor is, can be used as a read sensor for magnetic recording. Traditionally, the reading head of magnetic recording uh, was based on, on the Faraday effect. But the Faraday effect requires high flux. And then as the bit became smaller and smaller, the flux became smaller and there was a physical limitation. By introducing this real head with magnetic resistance, it was, it was possible to reduce the size of the bit, the bit that stores the magnetization, the information. And the evolution of the, the area density in gigabytes per square inch along the years can be seen here. When, when the magneto resistance was introduced, the, 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 the inclination of the curve changed and then it, it, it increased fast with the giant magneto resistance. Now it has decreased, it's still increasing. And now we need new ideas to how to, to keep increasing this, uh, the, 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 the capacity of hardness. But the fact is that uh, the introduction of the GMR reading heads made possible the gradual decrease in the reading heads. And this is the explanation for the, one of the explanations for the larger capacity of hard disks. Of course, the material used in the hard disk also makes a big difference. But the fact that the, the, the reading head is smaller um, makes possible to have larger capacity. Need new ideas in spintronics comes here. There's another important effect which was predicted theoretically in 1996 by Sonsuski and Berger, which is illustrated here. Let's say that we have a, an electric current going through a tri layer, a ferromagnetic layer, a non magnetic layer, a metallic layer, and a ferromagnetic layer. And let's say that the current here is spin polarized. It goes through, and when this is a simple-minded explanation, when the spin, when the electron will be spin in a different direction, reach the other ferromagnetic layer, which was uh, which was magnetized in this direction, and one electron will spin up goes out, there is a small change in the spin, and there is a small change in angular momentum. And the total change in the angular momentum depends on the number of electrons. And the change per unit time depends on the, on the current, the electron flux. And this actually represents a torque. A spin polarized current reaching a ferromagnet layer exerts a torque on the spins, on the magnetization, that is given by this expression here, S cross sigma cross s, and sigma is the polarization of the spins. Well, the speed transfer torque can also be used to make another type of memory, a random access, magnetic and random access memory. In a, a cell bit in a random access memory, has another ferromagnet layer to pin down a ferromagnetic layer, and then there is another ferromagnetic little layer here. And if a current goes through here, the resistance is slow. So the magnetization in this direction represents a bit zero. If the magnetization is reverse, resistance is high, this is bit one. So only by us using currents we can write the information by means of the spin transfer torque. By passing a current, one can switch the direction of the magnetization. And by passing a current, one can also read the information. So this is the basis of the random access memory. About a year and a half ago, almost two years, 
Samsung began mass production of magnet, magnetic environment access memory with several hundred uh, me megabits of capacity. Well, spintronics is the area of physics and technology that makes use of the electron spin to perform new functionality. Actually, the spin is in a way a natural carrier for digital information. Spin up represents one, spin down represents zero. And spintronics is a field that started with the, with the discovery and application of GMR. Albert Frecht, that I mentioned, uh, and Peter Greenberg, uh, they actually published their papers on GMR almost simultaneously. Uh, the paper by Frecht was published a year earlier, by uh, Greenberg developed the same ideas almost in that time. Greenberg has, has died uh, less than uh, almost a year ago, but Frecht is is 82 at the moment and still very active. I'm going to show a few papers on, 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 on very interesting topics written by Fair. So Spintronics, as I said, began with the discovery of GMR. And during the 90s, Several phenomena involving magnetic multilayer stuff, single films, interaction between ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic films, the exchange bias effect, interlayer coupling, GMR, spin valve phenomena, uh, magnetic tunneling, and new areas are here. I'm going to speak briefly in this talk on, the, on some spin current phenomena, spin pump and spin hall effect. I'm also going to speak about the spin Seebeck effect and uh, more recent topics, two-dimensional spintronics and antiferromagnetic spintronics. So this is a brief outline of the, of the talk. Let's move on. Uh, this is a, a very simplified illustration of a current, an electric current. In an electric current, I'm from I'm neglecting collisions. We have electrons moving and spin up and spin down. And the total charge current is the sum of the current with the spin up and current with spin down. So we have a, a net flux of charge through this cross section. But we don't have a net flow of the spin because to reach spin up, crossing the cross section, there is a spin down. However, if we have electrons with this opposite spin moving in opposite directions, then the charge current is zero. But the total spin current is non-zero because a spin current would spin up to the right has the same effect of a current to spin down to the left. Like in a semi semiconductors, electrons and holes. Electrons and holes move in opposite direction, but, but the sum of their currents, uh, uh, their currents add up because they have opposite charge. So this is a simple illustration of a, a spin current in a metal. And a spin current in, like this also can create a spin transfer torque. The expression is the same that I showed before. Because what's important is the spin transfer torque is precise, precisely the electron coming with a, with a spin. Another important effect, which was uh, actually made public by Hirsch in 1999. Hirsch is, is a professor at UC San Diego. He published his paper without knowing of a, a paper by Diakonov and Prell that was sort of buried in the literature. And Hirsch proposed theoretically an effect that he called spin hole effect. The spin hole effect is, 
is an idea based on, on the spin hall effect, the ancient spin hall effect. I mean, the ancient hall effect. The idea is that if we have a metal in which the, the electrons undergo scattering, and the scattering centers are sensitive to the spin up coupling, perhaps spin up coupling in the interaction, electrons will spin up will be deflected upwards and the electrons spin down will be deflected downwards because they have opposite angular momentum and, and opposite spins. So the, the scalar product is the same for, for both. So what Hirsch predicts is that a charge current would give rise to a spin current. See that this is a spin current here. Electrons spin up, going up, and electrons spin down, uh, going down. And, and, and the, the speed current density, current uh, unit, unit area, is proportional to the charge current. If we express the two currents in the same unit, charge current or spin momentum current, they are related by uh, dimensionless quantity, which is called spin hall angle. Sigma is the polarization of, of the spin, of the spin curve. Uh, so the spin hall angle, that's spin polarization. In platinum, uh, the spin hall angle is about 0 0.05. 0 0.05 is a large number, it means 5%. 5% of the huge amount of electrons, 10 to the 22 per cubic centimeters, are deflected. And nowadays we know materials, very involved combination of materials, that have a spin hall angle of nearly 50%, 5-0, 50%, very large. This effect was predicted in, in, in 1999, and it took a few years for people to make experiments to show that this existed. Another effect was predicted theoretically by, by this uh, quartet here, multinational quartet. Bratas is Norwegian, Tsarkovniak is Ukrainian, Bauer is Dutch, a helping American. They predicted that in if a material undergoes ferromagnetic resonance, there is a flow of angular momentum into an adjacent non-magnetic material, metal, and this is a, an angular momentum current. Angular momentum is spin, spin current. So they predicted that the spin current would flow out of the ferromagnetic layer, and this flow out of angular momentum would produce a damping, a an extra mechanism for damping. So what they predicted was that this would produce damping. They also came up with an expression for the spin current density in terms of the magnetization of the ferromagnetic medium. And they introduced this quantity here that characterized the interface. This is called the spin mixing conductors. It tells how, mu how much of the angular momentum flows into the other side. So a ferromagnetic resonance experiment is done by exciting a sample, a ferromagnetic sample with microwaves and looking at the response. Uh, normally one, one modulates the magnetic field applied to the sample. So what we observe is the derivative of the absorption uh, with respect to the magnetic field. So this is a, a ferromagnetic absorption of permalloy. Permalloy, which is a, a very soft ferromagnetic material, uh, is very much used to study spectronic phenomena of different kinds. Well, our group in the city was study, studying different things in, in, in multi-layers, and then in 2004, we presented uh, and my colleague, Antonio Zavello, 
presented an enormous paper in the MMM conference uh, held somewhere in the United States. Uh, the coincidence with the MMM conference this year is starting today. Uh, uh, in, and uh, Shule Zang will speak later today in a symposium. In fact, he spoke already. He had to record his, his presentation, but I'm going to listen only later. My colleague Antonio, several students, I was following the work from, from away because I was in Brazil at that time, uh, exchanging information, coming to Recife every two weeks. I was not following very close. We published this paper. A DC effect in ferromagnetic Brazil is this an evidence of this pinpoint effect with a question mark, which means that we did not understand well what we're doing. But by doing uh, fMR absorption in a, in a, in a cobalt uh, ion, cobalt ion, I believe, uh, layer, and placing two metallic contacts at the end, and measuring the voltage here, they measure the voltage, and the voltage has the shape of the Lorentzian line of the ferromagnetic resonance. This is the derivative. And, and then we were puzzled with this. We had several, some ideas. And we did experiment with different materials. And uh, depending on the materials used for, for the contact, depending on the material here, copper, palladium, tantalum, tungsten, the effect was larger. So we, we know we had something new there, but we could not explain what, what was observed there. And then, but then we said that uh, we believe that our observation uh, uh, has to do with the spin pumping effect, and the effect is due to a pure spin curve. What we could not explain was how this spin curve produced a voltage. Uh, we missed an opportunity here. But then, one year later, A.G. Saito in Japan had the explanation because he knew Hirsch's work. We did not know Hirsch's work. Uh, it was a, a big mistake. The, the effect is just the reciprocal of the spin hole effect. If we have a spin current coming in the material. In other words, electrons with opposite spin flow in opposite directions. Then if the undergoes scattering, uh, spin and orbit coupling induced the scattering, they will move in the same direction because now the two angular momentum have the opposite direction because the electrons come from the opposite direction. And they call this, uh, Saito called this the inverse spin hole effect. And this explains uh, how a spin current is, is, uh, can be converted into a ch charge current. Well, the spin hole effect now is well understood. There are new papers. Here's a paper by uh, Axel Hoffman. At the time, he was at the Argo National Lab. Now he's going, he's at the University of Illinois. Uh, another review in reviews of modern physics by this uh, big team. And this is an effect that, that, that is being used to study uh, different materials, new effects, and so on. There is a new effect, another one, discovered by the same Eiji Saito in Japan. What uh, Japan, uh, Saito uh, group did was this. They had a film of permaloy. Permaloy is nickel iron. 20 nanometer thick film. And then they applied a temperature gradient along the film. And they observed the voltage here and here. And the explanation was that the the temperature gradient produced a spin current in permaloy. 
the spin current goes in this uh, platinum layer and comes out of this platinum layer. And, and in this, uh, this is a spin current detector. A thin strip of platinum is a spin current detector because it transforms spin current into a voltage. And the voltage is big, several microvolts. And by changing the direction, well, they, they could measure the voltage in, in one strip and the other. They, real, they, they checked that they had opposite direction. By changing the direction of the magnetic field, the voltage also reverses. And they call this the spin Seebeck effect because it's, it's the, the, the analog of the ancient thermoelectric Seebeck effect occurring with spin currents. The same group, uh, Asian Saitor and students and collaborators like Salamishi Mayakawa, they, they observed an effect in an insulator. Here is an insulator, I'm going to, dis to speak more about this. They apply, they, they have an insulator here, a platinum strip along the insulator, and they apply the temperature difference across the film. So there is a, a, a heat current going across the film, and they measure the voltage along the strip. Here's the voltage. The voltage is, is measured along the platinum strip. They call this longitudinal species big effect to, to, because its configuration is different from the previous one. It turns out that this effect is much more important than the original one. But then comes the question, how can we have a spin current in an insulator? The explanation is that, well, first I'll, let me speak about the material. Uh, which was used in the original experiment. The material is yttrium organic. Yttrium organic is a very well known ferrimagnetic material that has been used for five decades to study different phenomena. Propagation of spin waves in the 60s, chaotic phenomena in spin waves, Bose Einstein condensation, and recently insulated spintronics. This is a material that's used commercially for making different products. And yeah, it can support spin waves. Here's a, uh, a simple view of a spin, wave, a spin wave. A spin wave carries a spin deviation. And a spin deviation, a moving spin deviation is a spin current. So the quanta of spin wave are magnets. And if we have a magnum population NK, magnum's group velocity VK, and if we sum over all magnum's velocity multiplied by Planck's coat and divided by the volume, we get speed current density, current per unit area. And uh, this is the uh, dispersion relation of the spin waves in the egg. And by knowing the dispersion relation, one can do calculations. And this discovery has, has aroused uh, the, the, the interest in the aid. Many things have been done with the aid in, in the recent years. So uh, one can make a specific experiment. Uh, this, this was done in, in our, la, our laboratory by using a copper base and then a Peltier module by heating or cooling the built here. And here we have uh, a, a substrate with a yang film and, a, and a, a metallic film like platinum or some other material. We apply a uh, temperature different and we vary the magnetic field and we measure the history of the cycle of the egg. By, by using different temperature differences, we have different voltages. This is this specific effect. On the other hand, if we fix the magnetic field, 
and we vary the temperature difference, we get uh, a linear variation uh, with a sign that depends on the direction of the magnetic field. Depends on the direction of the magnetic field because the polarization is determined by the magnetic field. Well, as soon as the effect was discovered, there was an explanation for the effect. And the explanation was given in these two papers. They attribute the effect to a temperature difference at the interface. We started working this effect and we actually did not agree with the explanation and had a different model. And the model, I have to rush a little bit, the model is this, the temperature gradient produces a spin current based on the marginals. And then we use the, 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 the cost of being introduced by these two other zangs, Stephen Zang and Shufe Zang. Um, when I first got the invitation from Shule, I went to check if the first author of this paper was him, but it, it was Stephen. Uh, Shufe is a, is a well-known uh, theoretician and many contributions to magnetic field. So the marginal accumulation is the number of marginals in excess of equilibrium. Using both the equation, we can calculate the spin current because we calculate the marginal accumulation. We have to use actually both the equation together with the diffusion equation and then, uh, and then, then we find an expression for the spin current. The spin current flows into the non-magnetic metallic layer. Here it's converted into a charge current by the spin inverse spin roll effect. And we can find an expression for, for the spin current, an expression for the voltage. Uh, and the voltage is proportional to the temperature gradient. Uh, I, mm, I forgot to, to put the expression for the voltage here. Uh, but the fact is that with this model, we can calculate the, the speed, the voltage due to the speed of the In fact, as a function of many quantities, a function of temperature, temperature gradient, as a function of magnetic field, and so on. And this publish was published in 2014. And today, uh, our, our model is recognized as the main explanation for the spin stability effect. Well, let, let me go, come back to the spin pumping experiments. As I said, the ferromagnetic resonance experiments are done uh, with the sample subject to a microwave excitation, like in a resonance spectrometry. What we do, is to place the sample at the end of our rod. We introduce the rod, and by doing this, we can rotate the rod and change the orientation of the sample. One can also make experiment using a microstrip assembly with the sample right on top of the microwave line and measure the voltage. So by placing contacts here, we measure the voltage. So, uh, the one can, using the, the magnetization associated with the ferromagnetic resonance, one can calculate the spin current, uh, and the spin current will depend on the, the microwave power inversely proportional to the line width, and one can have uh, an expression for the voltage produced between the two contacts in which all parameters can be known. If one of them is not known, like, like G, we can measure by now all other parameters. And notice that the voltage has the shape of a Lorentzian because it's the shape of the ferromagnetic absorption. So, uh, uh, we have an expression for the peak voltage. Intramagnetic is a material with very low losses. So when we do a ferromagnetic resonance experiment, we see a narrow line, but we also see other lines due to other uh, resonant modes. When we put platinum on egg, 
the line will increase due to the spin damping, spin pumping damping predicted by, uh, by, by the fellow that I mentioned. Uh, if we place tantalum, we get the same. And then if we measure the voltage, we, we have a nice signal in platinum. The signal is reversed if we reverse the magnetic field. And if you place the magnetic field at 90 degrees with the direction of the current, the field is zero, the, the, the voltage is zero. Tantalo has a negative spin hour angle. So the, the, the signals have the opposite directions. Anyone can do experiments and, and measure the quantities and so on. Uh, this, so this can, this can be done with three-dimensional systems. But a few years ago, five or six years ago, people started doing experiments with two-dimensional systems. And then in, in a 2D system, the mechanism for conversion is different. Uh, there are review papers on this topic, and this is a more recent paper in which Albert Fert is one of the authors, publishing in Nature. They review several phenomena involving spin uh, conversion between spin current to charge current in two dimensional system. The mechanism involved here is a different one. Let's consider an electron in a two dimensional plane. The Hamiltonian of a, of a free electron is given here. But then, if there is a spin orbit coupling, uh, in the plane or in an interface, there's a splitting between the bands of the spin in one direction and the other direction. If we look at this in three dimensions, we have here the direct circle, the, the Fermi circle. We have a Fermi circle with the electrons the spin in one direction, which is different than electrons spinning in the other direction. And this is due to the Hashiba interaction. So the two of the Fermi circles now have, uh, have, have spins, and this effect is, is called spin momentum locking. Electrons in the Fermi circle have the spin locked in this direction here. Uh, Edelstein predicted the effect uh, that involved uh, applying a current, he said in 1990, if you apply a current to a two-dimensional system, this current will displace the two Fermi circles, and this creates a polarization. So they predicted that a current in a two-dimensional plane in which there is spin-orbit coupling would produce a spin polarization. And the opposite effect is called the, the inverse Edelstein effect. And this effect was observed uh, by, by Fecht. And we also observed this effect in spin pumping with graphene. Uh, we had a, a layer of graphene deposited on top of a egg film. We applied microwaves and we observed by placing two metal contacts at the end of the graphene layer, we observed uh, a voltage, a voltage uh, peak in one direction or in the opposite direction, depending on the direction of the magnetic field. And the explanation uh, is the fact that although graphene has very small spin of the coupling, when graphene is in contact with the egg, uh, there is an induction of a uh, spin of coupling. This creates, creates a Hashba field. And then there is a spin current. And this produces a, a voltage. And by measuring the voltage, we could obtain the parameter that characterizes the, 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 the inverse Hashba Edelstein effect. This was done in 2015. Later, we did similar experiments with a topological insulator, uh, a 
uh, six, six quantum layers of uh, tellurium antimony and bismuth measured effects. We had to extract the, the, the part of the effect not evolved in the in, in this, and we measured also the the the, the the inverse Edelstein effect length. Uh, this was uh, published three years ago. We also measured this in, in a 2D semiconductor, in, in sulfide, molybdenum, molybdenum sulfide, uh, and uh, similar things. So by, by studying the voltage induced, uh, one can study the effect involved in the spin charge conversion. And this is something that has been done by several groups. The last topic of this talk in the 10 minutes remaining is the correction. I have 10 more minutes. Antiferromagnetic spin charges. I will also give only brief information. <clears throat> As you know, antiferromagnets have no net magnetic moment because they have spins in opposite directions. The total magnetic moment is zero. This is a simple view of an antiferromagnetic light. Well, antiferromagnets are used in, in many applications only to pin the magnetic layer. So the role of antiferromagnets is traditionally a passive role. However, uh, antiferromagnets have interesting properties. For instance, since they have no net magnetic order, uh, the, 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 the spins in, in an antiferromagnet are not perturbed by external magnetic fields. Uh, also, so, and also, they don't, don't produce a strain field. Also, the magnums, the spin waves in antiferromagnets have very large frequency. So the dynamics of antiferromagnets is, 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 is very, very fast. So dynamic effect, like terahertz excitation, can be studied in antiferromagnets and more difficult to do with ferromagnets. So in recent years, Antiferromagnetic materials have been attracting interest and there are review papers. This paper by Jean Gris, uh, Marty Wadler, I'm going to talk about one of their papers in, in Nature and Te Technology in 2016. Uh, this is a recent uh, reviews of modern physics paper by several people. Uh, two more papers. Review papers. So there are several review papers now. Uh, we, we did one experiment with an antiferromagnet uh, a few years ago. Uh, we used iridium manganese, which is an antiferromagnetic metal. We put on top of the egg and we measured this P, the inverse spin hole effect in iridium magnets. Uh, in fact, the effect is so strong that we, one can see the various resonant modes. Uh, and, 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 and this was the first uh, detection of the inverse spin hole effect in antiferromagnet. Jules Wirst, that I mentioned, and Wadley published a paper in Science in which they used uh, an antiferromagnet uh, uh, copper manganese arsenide in the shape here to store magnetic information. And the magnetization, of course, is, is stored in spins that are in the opposite direction. But they discovered that, that by pen, with a suitable arrangement, they can write information with the right current, two currents right here and they can read information with two read currents. So they managed to, to build a, a, a magnetic cell to store information with an antiferromagnetic material. 
the interesting thing is that th this memory is not uh, affected by external magnetic fields, like a uh, hard disk is affected, for instance. Well, another effect, I think that the last one, is pin feedback effect in an, in an antiferometer. Nickel oxide is an insulator. It's an antiferromagnet at room temperature. The nail temperature of nickel oxide is 525. So we did experiments of the Spinsebeck effect. This is a Peltier module. This is a, a, a metallic layer. And this is nickel oxide. And by varying the magnetic field with different temperature difference, we measured a hysteresis cycle of nickel oxide. And by, by keeping the, the magnetic field and changing the temperature difference, we measured the linear variation of the voltage. And we also measured the angle dependence, uh, which is given by uh, a sign function because this, the charge current is js cross sigma. And uh, later we did experiments with low temperature and high magnetic fields with the same material. But then we, we, we took nickel oxide and made a, a hall bar above nickel oxide. This is the setup to apply a current and to measure the temperature with a Shernox thermometer. And then by varying the magnetic field uh, at different sample temperatures, we could measure the evolution of the, of the specific effect in the temperature. Then we also made a model. So these are measurements and these are the results of the model. The model for uh, for uh, for the specific effect was an extension of the model that developed for ferromagnets. We have a sort of a review paper published in in the Journal of Physics D a couple of years ago, in which we developed a theory for the specific effect for ferromagnets and for antiferromagnets and, and so on. So. Uh, the interconversion between three types of currents, charge current, spin current, and heat current, has largely increased the possibilities for process information. This is shown in this figure here. Uh, conversion between charge current and heat current is in the old field of thermoelectricity. Uh, Spintronic deals with the conversion of charge current to spin current in either direction. This can be done either by the spin hole effect or the inverse spin hole effect, or can be done by the other side effect or the inverse other side effect. And the conversion of heat current, heat current to spin current is the spin feedback effect, and the inverse is the spin perturbation effect. And this is the area of spin color electronics. So the whole field is developing rapidly and the discovery of new phenomena involving these uh, uh, various currents. There are several books uh, which are normally um, a collection of chapters, each on a different uh, topic. And publications have been increasing fast. And I end with a commission. Uh, recently, Springer published a book that I wrote, which is a textbook for graduate students, Fundamentals of Magnetics, uh, different things. The last chapter of the book is Magnetic Spintronics. So the book is not a book on spintronics, it's on magnetics. Uh, and uh, I was very happy with the publication of this uh, book. And finally, uh, photo of my collaborators, Antonio Azevedo, uh, Roberto Rodriguez, Fernando Machado, some students, colleagues, and this is a view of downtown Recife, 
and that I mentioned that I showed in the map uh, uh, later. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sergio, for the nice overview of the recent development of uh, the field of magnetism and spintronics. So any uh, questions from the audience? I see uh, one question from the chat, but I think uh, you answered that uh, uh, yeah. already. So is it possible to have inverse spin Z-back effect that's the spin uh, Peltier effect? I think you mentioned that. Has that been observed yet? It's called spin Peltier effect, of course. It's a much weaker effect. So it was observed, it was predicted. Uh, as soon as the Spitzelbeck effect was observed and studied, but it took a few years for people to observe uh, the observations much more complex. Uh, but now there are a few papers uh, with experimental observation, also theoretical uh, models for the effect. Great. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, Walter. <laughs> I uh, let me put my video on so you can see me. I'm Walter Lambrecht. So you mentioned that in an insulator you could have basically uh, magnons that correspond to a spin current and can be converted at an interface to a charge current. Sort of in the same vein, can one use the opposite effect to sort of launch magnons and magnon waves? Yes. Did you hear the question? Yeah, if, if, you, if, you, if you apply a, a current pulse, the current pulse, let's say that we, we need to have a spin polarized, but the spin polarized current will produce a spin torque, and the spin torque excites the magnetization, and then launches a spin wave. I see, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have got a quick question about uh, uh, the material, the uh, egg. Egg actually is a, fer a ferry magnet, uh, uh, um, but people usually uh, normally just consider the acoust acoustic mode of the magnons. Is that because, and then neglect the optical mode. Is that because the, uh, the, the frequency of that optical mode is too high and normally it's not uh, accessible? Yes. Um, See, egg is the material that can be handled easily, that has the lowest magnetic losses known. It's amazing property because the unit cell of the egg has uh, 20, 20, well, the primitive cell has 24 atoms. So it's a huge cell. So there are 24 modes one acoustic mode and, sorry, I mean, 20 modes, I'm sorry, 20. So there's one acoustic mode and 19 optical modes. Now, all optical modes are in, in the terahertz frequency range. So at room temperature, they may have some small effect, but it's small effect. At lower temperature, they have no effect. So, uh, uh, one can obtain very good results considering only the acoustic modes. So the, the, the contribution of the optical modes are a small corrections. Mm. All right, thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Can I have a question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I believe you are all teaching remotely, right? Are you teaching regularly by the internet? And how long have you been doing this? Well, I, uh, we do teach you regularly. Um, and uh, we uh, usually for theoretical course, we, uh, we teach, we all teach, we go remote and teach, uh, uh, we have online uh, mode. And I think only for uh, like experimental uh, courses with experimental component, we have a hybrid mode. Um, when did you start teaching online? 
uh, with the beginning of the pandemic. Maybe some delay, a few weeks delay. In March. Okay. Yeah, in March. It, it took us uh, three months to, to start doing this. And as, as I said in our conversation previously, I think that after this thing ends sometime, we, we're going to have to learn how to use our time more efficiently using hybrid ways of teaching. And we need to learn from, from you that started earlier. I see. Well, uh, Sergio, if you have uh, still have some time, we can have an uh, uh, unrecorded uh, informal session after I stop the recording. Let's first thank our speaker again. I stopped the recording. Thank you.